Good morning again. I'm excited about this morning. I'm always excited about Pentecost Sunday, but I've entitled my message for this morning, How Far Will You Go? To understand what Pentecost is about, to put into action what Pentecost is really telling us, and to have a little fun with the Holy Spirit. Remember the word that we call the wind. What? Ruah. Ruah. From deep and guttural sound. Ruah. It's that wind that came through the upper room and changed the lives of the, the apostles. I think the question is, how far will you go to share that excitement of Pentecost Sunday for the rest of this year? It is something we have fun with. But it's real and true and, and it is something that gets inside of us that makes us different people than who we were when we woke up this morning. There's no limit to how far the apostles would go once they were empowered by, by the Holy Spirit. Now this morning I have just a couple of little stories I want to share with you to help you understand about when and their connection to God and God's connection to us through that the onset of the Holy Spirit. When Candy and I were in Northeast Georgia going to seminary, we had that little church, Hickory Flat. And many of you have heard the story before. Why do they call this Hickory Flat? Because the town's Lula and the other town's Homer. But it's the flat place in the road where they cut all the hickory trees down to build the church. Hickory Flat was the community. And there was a weather report that came out that said, um, we're looking at storms. I had been there coming back from Atlanta where I was going to school. It's about an hour and a half drive to North Georgia. And we were concerned that, that our faith community would be okay. We heard there's not only lightning and thunder and rain, but maybe a chance of a tornado. Well, guess what? There was a tornado that day. And Tornado Alley came right down in front of the church on the highway, 52. And just in front of the church, it made a split. One went north, one went west. And this tornado came and followed that road all the way down. And it came right past our little church. Took a few leaves off the tree. Turned right and headed north. And it was running right through this road that was overwhelmed by trees and it just made a little path until it broke into a clearing this was less than a mile from our little church it was the little clearing was the assembly of God church where the pastor and his wife lived on the premises with the church and just so happened that very unusual things happened that day they had been married a long time she had some doctor's appointments. He had doctor's appointments. Generally, they went separately. But that day, she said, Dear, I'm a little concerned about this appointment. Will you take me? He goes, you know, it's, i got to get ready for Sunday. She goes, really? I'm asking you, will you take me to, to the doctor? Now, now, those of you that are familiar at all with Georgia know that there's a Gainesville, Georgia. It was about 45 minutes away. So they packed up all their stuff for the, for the trip into the doctor's appointment, and the two of them left. Now they locked all the doors for the church, prepared their house, and locked the doors for the church for, from the house. And, and they had a little, a little dog, and they said, well, we're going to be going a long time. Let's, we'll put him on a leash and, and tie him to the stair, the stair uh, rail. So this storm, back to the storm. It came around the corner, went through first open space. It took a it took a left, and when they returned home from Georgia, uh, from Gainesville, there was nothing left on their whole property except a rail and a leash and a dog with eyes about this big. It looked like like nature had used the vacuum cleaner and just cleaned up. Everything there. And you know what? We searched the entire county. Never found at the least of a shingle from that church or that house. 
Wind is powerful. The parsonage was gone. The church was gone. But the dog was still there with eyes as big as a softball. The question I think that Bear is asking is, what does it take for you to be overcome by the winds of the Holy Spirit? It comes to us this morning as a foundation in the book of Acts. The second chapter of the first 21 verses. Now I had a, a volunteer that said that they would help read this one, but this one's a little tough. It's talking about the people that were in Jerusalem at the time of the festival. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each of them heard them speaking in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, <coughs> are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthian, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? And somehow we made fun of them and said they had too much wine. And then Peter stood up. We know who Peter was and what Peter's uh, personality was. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. And the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Here's the important part. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Before ministry, Candy and I lived in multiple places, and mostly in Florida, California, Georgia. But we lived one time in a place called Bel Air Bluffs. It's kind of north Clearwater, if you know anything about the our community there. Our kids were um, in school on the beach side. We were on the mainland side and there was a causeway that connected us. Well, it's all about Mother Nature today, isn't it? It's about winds, it's about storms, it's about what changes who you are inside and then to the world. And so the storms were projected to be pretty brutal. Hurricane was coming up the, the Florida West Coast and they weren't sure where it was going to hit. Honeywell, the employer that I had at that time, closed the plant down so that we could be with our families. We rushed home. I drove all the way up to Bel Air Bluffs. Candy and I jumped in the car. We dashed across the causeway to pick up our kids who were in school on the beach side. I've never seen a causeway like that. The waves were 
were being sent from one side of the causeway up over and on the other side and then crashing back this way and, and it was like we were in a car wash. And we went across to the to the to the beach side and went down to school and we picked up the kids and they were having a great day and what a can't think of a better excuse to get out of school, right? Yeah. On the way back, K2 says to us, Mom, Dad, let's take a look at the surf. <laughs> Hurricane's coming right up the coast and my son wants to take a look at the surf. There was a little place you could pull in on the way. We pulled in in two seconds. We pulled in and as we were pulling in, the storm was drawing the water out like the tides. And along with it, it picked up a swimming pool from the hotel. And like a barge going out to sea, it went out probably 100 yards and then broke up in the sea. And then Michelle goes, Dad, look at this. She points to this hotel that was right there on the side of that pool. On the fourth story, there was a full-size palm tree that had been catapulted through the corner of the building, through one window and out the other, with the one end on the outside and the other end on this outside. It is the power of wind, and that's where what God chose to make a difference in our lives with the wind of the Holy Spirit. What a powerful thing that we face. The apostles were sitting in the room. The wind was above them. They saw the flames dancing upon each other. And they weren't sure what to do. They were bewildered. They were amazed. But the thing that happened next, they were courageous. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the apostles began to speak in the language of all the people that were in Jerusalem at that time. It is an amazing act of God. It is a miracle to share the gospel with people that are different from us with the message that they can hear and understand. What should we expect today? That was a long time ago. That's when God was active. How about now? But what do we do today on Pentecost Sunday to understand what it means to have winds more powerful than Mother Nature. It's Pentecost. The Holy Spirit can, will, surround you and fill you. And miracles happen. On that day, if you read just a little further than where we were in our passage of this morning, 3,000 came to know the Lord. That's like a Billy Graham crusade on steroids. They came and it made a difference in their lives. The Holy Spirit was around them and through them and changed their lives. And one gift of the Holy Spirit is courage. It was a time of tremendous persecution. Something most of us know very little about. We see it on TV. Yet the kingdom grew, spread like wildfire because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. In our time, churches all over are in a time of decline. Membership is down. Attendance is down. Why now? Why not unbelievable growth like the, the day of Pentecost in the beginning? Why don't we see the world excited and growing and sharing the gospel. What can you do about that? What do you leave this place with today that will change the venue of God in our, in our community around us? What can you do to tell other people about a Holy Spirit excitement in your life? The verses that follow talk about the apostles and those impacted by the Holy Spirit gathered together, not for lunch, to 
praise God. To give God the, the glory and the credit. Every Sunday we pray, don't we? Multiple times. But during the main prayer, we say the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, we talk about daily bread. That's what God wants to hear. I'm going to empower you with daily bread that you might praise me daily. Moment by moment. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Making a difference in your life so you can make a difference in someone else. This day, our daily bread. It, that's not like a baker's dozen. It. It, it's not something we talk about as a recipe for making bread. It's acknowledging God's presence. Moment by moment. That God is still alive and well and living within our hearts. And is a daily sustainer and provider. Trusting brings empowerment. Trusting brings courage. You see, when we count on God, when we can leave everything up to God's eternal plan. On that first Pentecost, people called. They were not special. They were ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Individuals who came together because of a common cause, a common calling. Well, like now. We're here for a common calling. Jesus set the stage for us to follow. Death was conquered. Eternal life is open to everyone who believes. That's all it takes, is to believe. They had no mission statement. They had no goals or objectives. They had no articles of incorporation. They had no PowerPoint presentations, no music from the speakers, no videos on the screen. They just had courage to go forward with a message that God placed on their heart. A businessman was on a trip and it turns out that he had to stay over for the weekend. He had to leave his family and, and um, fend for himself that weekend. So he got up early on Sunday morning and got dressed and he was going to go find a church to attend because that's something that his family did quite often. So he went down to the lobby and had a quick cup of coffee and he walked out on the street and as he was walking out on the street there was a, a policeman walking along and he said to the policeman, can you tell me where there's a church within walking distance of this hotel? And without missing a beat, the policeman said, one block down, one block over. And he says, well, thank you. He started to turn and walk the way that the policeman had uh, guided him and he said, but, sir, why is it that you recommended that church? And the policeman looked at him and he said, you know, I'm not a church goer, but I'm here every Sunday on my beat. And he says, I've never seen any other example of people so happy and excited to be together. When church is over, they come out with smiles on their faces. What a difference it makes. I believe they're the happiest people in our town. And I would say to you, that's a testimony. Close to God, close to one another. Those two things point to a strong relationship to share. When you leave today, will you exude a sense of excitement, a sense of love, a sense of courage? If so, you'll probably be empowered to take that beyond just these walls and just these doors. Because you see, when that happens, it's Pentecost all over again. Say with me, Ruach. 